theme song is uh, snappy. We have a snappy theme song. It it is snappy. I am happy with it. I'm glad you're happy with it too. Yeah, it's it's snappy. It's peppy. You know, it's it's got some pepper in it. Nice. I like. You know it. what this? You know what the secret is though. Uh, blood. Kazoo's. Oh, okay. I thought the secret was like this thing where you you. If you think it will happen, then it will happen, like the like the law of attraction. That's what I thought the secret was. Well, yeah, there's that shit, too, you know. <clears throat> it was also a really good basis for an episode of It's Always Funny in Philadelphia. I have not seen that show. It, it looks, yeah. I don't know. I never, I never saw it, but once I, we, once I saw an episode, I, I, quickly fell into it. It helps yeah. that I really like Charlie Day because he's amazing. I love him. Yeah, I, I kept thinking that was Danny DeVito and I was able to confirm that it is Danny DeVito in that show, so frankly, that's all I really needed to know. <laughs> so now I don't yeah. have to watch the show at all. <sighs> should should we do Welcome to the ah, there you go. Film? Yeah. Yeah. You know what's by now, so let's not even bother with that. How was your week? Yeah. Um. The, if, if the the difficult part about this week's podcast is you know, for me to not be coughing up big green chunks of shit every five seconds. Even now, it's difficult for me not to be making a million gross noises. Since, we have just, since, since this see, is all audio, if we were doing a video podcast, that would actually be pretty awesome. Yeah, maybe. But you know. but my whole my whole family has now succumbed to the sickness. Yeah. It's difficult at work because sometimes it'll just be, okay, so this person called in sick and this person called in sick and then this manager called in sick so, Steve, you're going to be doing this and this and this. You're going to be pretty much the only person on the floor for the next couple of hours. And it's it, it's it's been difficult, very yeah. difficult. And also, I don't get sick a lot, but when I do get sick, it's just, it, it, it's it's horrible. I turn into, I turn into a crying baby because it just hurts so much. Because most of the time, I just don't get too sick. I mean, the kids, yeah. they get sick because they're kids, but I think it's because, I think I've been immune to it for so long because I have three kids, so I've I've spent a l- large portion of my life now just cleaning up gross shit uh-huh. that somehow that's allowed me to be immune in a way. But it, it, it's been difficult. I've been trying to work through as much of it as I can because I, I don't have any, really any sick time right now. So I on Saturday, I was like, oh, well, my voice is a little bit rocky. So, you know, it, it, let's see what kids show up for story time. And then I had 30 kids show up for story time. And I was like, I said, great, kids. 30 people showed up, and I'm losing my voice. So this is what today's story time is going to be. Uh, we're going to sit quietly and not talk for an hour. <laughs> the kids didn't like that, and I ended up losing my voice. So I'm a little bit uh, froggy, I think would be the word, right now. But, but on the upside, it sounds like you successfully <gasps> passed it on to 30 children. Uh, which, yes, that's which good. Is the best way for the uh, the simian flu to spread. Yeah, I'm hoping to be uh, patient zero for this for the Q virus. Yeah, yeah, I I I I've always kind of wanted to be a patient zero for something. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, basically just you know, no matter what, whatever I have to do to get. Maxwell had it first, and poor Maxwell, he's still at this age where he doesn't understand what getting sick means. He just, he he was just laid out and feverish and horrible. And then 
he gave it to me, and I gave it to my wife, and my, my wife gave it to my oldest daughter, and then the whole time, though, it, little Isabella has just been bouncing around and all happy and everything, and then yeah. we all started getting better, and then suddenly she was miserable. So now we're slowly but surely getting better. I got to the point yesterday where I can actually cough without feeling like my forehead is bleeding my brains out of my ears. Mm-hmm. So that's good. Uh, apparently, I, I I do look like I'm not sick. Uh-huh. I, I, oh, that always, because, that always kind of sucks because then you don't get to see either, you know? Yeah. Because I, I asked somebody the last time I was at work, I was like, hey, do I look like I'm here? And they're like, yeah, no, you look fine. And I'm like, okay, good, because I don't feel here, but it's nice to know that I look like I'm here. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, yeah. no, no, it's much better to get the sympathy I find. <laughs> I, I watched this week's movie with a uh, 100 degree infant on my chest. So I believe that half of what I saw may have just been a fever dream. So that's fun. With this particular movie, it's going to be kind of hard to tell, I think. Yeah. Because I think even if you didn't have the child on your lap, you would still be wondering if it were a fever dream. Yeah, yeah. And, in fact, it probably just is. I, are you, are you, um, I'm pretty sure that I already know the answer to this, but are you intimately familiar with uh, SpongeBob SquarePants by any chance? Intimately, no. No? Okay. All right, do you have a passing knowledge of Spongebob Squarehead. A, a passing a passing knowledge. Basically, we're friends. <clears throat> okay. I was just wondering because um, I, I came across something that I think is, is pretty brilliant in regards to Michael Bolton. Really? Okay. I, because I was watching um, one of of our two part homework assignment for this week's episode, uh, the 1993 direct to VHS oddity Michael Bolton's winning softball. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out what his look was. I was trying to figure out how to describe Michael Bolton's look, and and it was difficult to do. The the closest that I got to it was uh, perhaps if if Weird Al Yankovic tried to be sexy. I kind of think he sort of looks like uh, if Animal got into a really good rehab. Yeah, maybe. But, like, if Weird Al Yankovic tried to be sexy and dyed his hair blonde, but maybe there was something wrong with the dye and he started balding. <laughs> but then still tried to pass off the long hair look. That that might be Michael Bolton. Hey, yeah. I also thought he kind of looked like a scarecrow, like like a cross between scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz and and like the bad guy from Batman. But then, uh-huh. but then I realized the perfect way to describe him, how he looks. I nailed it. But in order to fully respect how much I nailed it, you, you really have to know your SpongeBob SquarePants. Or at oh. least, you know, do a quick Google image search because um, uh, Michael Bolton is essentially the character that is referred to as Sexy Squidward. Sexy Squidward. Sexy Squidward. If you do an image search for Sexy Squidward, that's pretty much Michael Bolton's face. You just put like a like a like a wig with Dutch Elm disease on top of sexy Squidward, and that's Michael Bolton 
and I I totally nailed that because it 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 looks exactly like him. Because Squidward is just this ugly, pathetic guy, but he gets into an accident, which, because he already looks kind of ugly, causes him to look really handsome. Okay. So he's he, he suddenly has bald. this. Huh? He's green and bald. I look like a dude. Blue, like sexy Squidward or handsome Squidward, but. That's a, that's pretty much like a bluish, greenish, more blue, I think. Yeah. But the chiseled jaw and, and features of handsome Squidward, sexy Squidward, is essentially Michael Bolton. Then you just put a mop on his head, and that's Michael Bolton. What did you think of Michael Bolton's winning softball? Do you feel that you have a better softball game? I I do feel I have a better softball game. I, I <laughs> um I'm glad that Michael Bolton has something to like fall back on if his music career ever tanks. <laughs> yeah, well, his team, the Bolton Bombers, went sixty-seven and three at one point. Yeah, and that's that's pretty amazing. And one one of the things that I really love, there, there are two things that I love about part one of our homework this week, Michael Bolton's winning softball. Number one is um, a lot of the tips he gave could be sex tips. And I realized this right from the beginning, and it really cheered me up. So I wrote down some of the tips that he gave oh, okay. uh, that I think um could go either way. Um grip it to rip it. <laughs> Explode through the ball. Mm-hmm. You don't want to wiggle your bat and you don't want to choke it. That's good advice. Well sometimes you want to do now granted not at the at the same time. Sometimes you want to wiggle it. Sometimes you want to choke. But my my favorite was when Michael Bolton said, thanks to your tips, I'm hitting it harder, farther, and more consistently than I ever have before. <laughs> yeah. That's when I went, hey, now, you know, with some, with some good editing, you really could change this into, like, Michael Bolton's winning sex. Mm-hmm. Winning sexy American time. The other thing that I really liked about this video is the, is how obsessed this man is with softball. It 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 got a little spooky. It, you know, it got a little spooky. Like he's close to missing shows to play softball. You know that. Yeah. And at one point in time, he said that that he actually. At one point in time, he said that he actually plays more softball games than concerts at times. And that's when you know that, okay, well, maybe, you know, you might be a bit too much into the softball <laughs> if you're this obsessed with the, the man just, just got like a, like a crazy softball look in his eyes at times. And yeah, just all, I mean, that's, that's one of the first signs. If, you know, if you're losing time off of your job for whatever you do, drinking or softball or something like that. You know, that's one of the signs that you need a call to that program. Yeah, he's like a softball aholic. But hey, it harder. Play smarter. That's if what I keeps, learned. If it keeps him out of the concert halls, I'm all for it. <laughs> but you know, the, the, whole, the whole the whole video I'll buy him a mix. <laughs> the the whole video is is apparently based on uh, legendary softball pitcher Dave Carroll's eight steps to hitting with authority. Mm-hmm. And so I really wanted to to know who this Dave Carroll was, and so I I looked him up. I I tried to figure I... out. Before you elaborate on that, I absolutely loved 
the incredibly long introduction that he had in yeah. particular, because I was I was like, if he is this well known throughout the softball community, <laughs> doesn't just about anybody watching this video pretty much already know who he is? And also, are there professional softball teams? Because they say, they call him a professional softball player. They say that he was the star of a number of professional softball teams. What's a professional softball team? Is there like a MLSB somewhere that I don't know about? I I do not know, but if any of our listeners know, please inform us. If you know, if you are or know somebody who is on a professional softball team, let us know, because I have never heard of one in my life. Dave Carroll, the legendary softball pitcher. He talked, he seemed, he seemed slow. Yeah. He talked slow. He had that voice like the, the guy with the deep voice who sang Elvira, the band Alabama. Right. Yeah, he has a decent twang going on. Yeah, he did the Oom Papa Mau Mau's <laughs> for Alabama in the Elvira song. Anyway, Dave Carroll went to prison for bank fraud. Really? He That's did. what I learned about Dave Carroll. Yeah. I imagine that he I imagine that he frauded the bank by saying, I'm a professional athlete. Mm-hmm. And they said, here, have a bunch of money. But then they realized, oh, wait, softball? You're going to jail. Yeah, but well, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe it's a little kind of like softball fraud going on here. Yeah. There, There is no such thing, but he has convinced the world that there is professional softball. How how can anyone be a professional softball player? I just, that just didn't make any sense to me. No, no. Are they all <laughs> sponsored by the local church? I I don't know. There's no there's no there are no major league softball teams out there. That just that just I I had the hardest time. I had the hardest time with that. But but seriously. If there's one thing that this video really made me think about, um, it's how was Michael Bolton so popular? How did he Uh, get so big? Well, first off, is he so popular anymore? I don't think so. Him and Yanni. Yeah. That seems but to I be, can't. have been quite a while ago now. Yeah. I bet Michael Bolden now is just trolling softball fields. Mm-hmm. He's probably such an addict that he's like uh, sleeping in parks that have softball fields. Yeah. And he's all skinny and emaciated like, hey, have you guys got a game? You guys got a game going? You need a, you need a player? I used to be in the in Bolton's Bombers. Hey, you, you guys need a... They're like, go home, Bolton. You're drunk. Off of softball. Come on, just one game? Just one game? He's scratching his neck like crazy. All wide-eyed. We'll sing for a knuckleball. Yeah. yeah. Probably. He's probably well, riding his bike throughout Hollywood looking for a softball game. And he sees one and he runs over there. You guys need an extra? I, I can just sit on the bench. <laughs> Crashing elementary school softball games. Yeah. Well, that is definitely the vibe I was getting there. That man was way, way too into softball. Yeah. Uh, to be of use to anybody. Like he was going to his concerts and it's like, 
Okay, we've got to end this concert quick. We have a very important softball game tomorrow. So we're only going to sing one song. We're going to sing our big popular song, whatever that is. And then we got to get to bed, guys. Come on, we've got an important game tomorrow. <laughs> That's how insane Michael Bolton apparently is or was for softball. Yeah. I wonder if they all have, like, little nicknames that they didn't show us, like Stinky and Leadfoot and, you know. I'd probably. Kind of, kind of like the whole Bad News Bears sort of thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. Or the Sandlot or something like that. Uh, I want some big league chew. Now that I'm thinking of baseball. I want some big league chew. I'm a big fan of gum. Are you? Yes. I'm a huge fan of gum. I have an oral fixation. I just need to have something in my mouth all the time. I try really hard not to go to work and then pick up a pen and then automatically start chewing on it. That has grossed people out in the past, to pick up a pen at work and then to see bite marks all over it. So yeah. I try to have like uh some starburst on me or some gum or just anything so that ooh, I just I I love gum so much. I was having a conversation recently with my oldest daughter and she gave me some gum and it was bubble gum flavored and I told her uh-huh. I said when I was a kid this was the only flavor of bubble gum. Bubble gum just tasted like this. Now you go to the store, and there's 80 different bubble gums. Yeah. And some of them are like, oh, super extra long-lasting. It's cold, but it'll turn hot in your mouth and rub your freaking nutsack and play MP3s. hmm But in my day, it was just gum-flavored gum. And, and that is the only place in nature that that flavor occurred. Yeah. In gum. used to be the same way with coffee. It used to just be coffee. Coffee yeah, was right? coffee. Yeah, I'm kind of down with Dennis Theory on that. How the hell do I get a <laughs> coffee-flavored coffee? Yeah. That's how it used to be with gum. Half and half, maybe a little sugar. Okay. That's yeah. It. Now there's a bunch of different flavors of Bazooka Joe. Now they have, like, Strawberry Bazooka Joe and Grape Bazooka Joe and Sour Apple, whatever the hell, Bazooka Joe. And I'm like, Emerald, when Bella, when I was a kid, there was just one flavor of Bazooka Joe, brick-flavored. And you hated it, but it came with a goddamn comic strip in it. Uh And a tiny little fortune. And that's why... Yeah, try this horrible glass flavored freaking gum. And I love try saving the comics to get. Oh yeah, but that never worked. Yeah, I I never did that. I I tried to, but well, but I never did. I never that never worked. I'm a huge well, they, fan uh, though. Wanted of trident of layers. What did you say? They wanted hundreds and hundreds. Like you would have to save up like. 5,000 of the little comics to get the little cheap binoculars. Yeah. Remember that? Or the yo-yo or whatever. It was like some <coughs> ugly amount yeah. of things. A baseball be. cap. Yeah. Yeah. One of these so days I, I just wanted Bazooka ever Joe. Ever yeah. One of these days I just wanted Bazooka Joe to just finally get the bazooka and That's just lay waste to everybody. <laughs> I just kept waiting. Like, I'm assuming all of these comic strips are just chronicling the post traumatic stress that led to him snapping. <laughs> that one day he's just going to be like, you know what? Tired of your crap. <laughs> and what was up with his friend that wore his sweater over his face? I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah. He was um, a Jughead wannabe. I know that. 
Yeah, kind of, kind of. Um, and how in the thousands of little Bazooka Joe comics, how is it possible that not even one of them was funny? I do not know. I think that you wouldn't you think that at least like one or two would have to be funny accidentally at least. Yeah. You know? My kids get a lot of laffy taffy and yeah. I always get the laffy taffy from them and read the jokes to them. But I accidentally but every time that I read the jokes to them, I there because there are two jokes. So I'll read one joke and then give them the answer to the other joke. Okay. Why did the chicken cross the road? When pigs fly. Ah. I'm always proud of that. Any chance I can get to um, to mess with children's heads. I was going to say fuck with little children, but that's probably not a good thing to say. <laughs> no. yeah, It could be taken yeah, out of context. Good. It's funny because Michael Bolton's winning softball is almost an hour long. And right. the second the second part of our homework, fake semen, was nine minutes long. I had a harder time watching nine minutes than I did watching almost an hour of Michael Bolton's obsession with softball. <laughs> and the problem, I had a hard time watching uh, How to Make Fake Semen, and the problem was the host was just a real smarmy creepo. <laughs> For starters, he kept pausing for laughter that wasn't there. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to teach you how to make fake semen. Why, you ask? Well, YouTube's <laughs> rules and regulations state I can't teach you how to make the real thing. Four, mm -hmm. three, two, one. But seriously, folks. And it's like, no, I'm not laughing. You don't have to pause there. Freaking Dave Chappelle, because there's no laughs happening. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's part of his charm. I really do. <laughs> I think. I think. I think his whole way of presenting this was made it like one of the funniest tutorials I've ever seen in my life. And also, it's not so much that he's making fake semen. Yeah. Is that look at this guy making fake semen? <laughs> And also, I just say, he's a, he's smarmy. He was smarmy. He was a smarmy guy. But, but do you remember what he was making the fake semen for? Fifty Shades of Grey, the pop-up book? The pop-up. Fifty Shades of Grey, the pop-up book. Yeah. Ugh, fucking Yeah, I, I wonder if he ever finished it. You should go look into that one. Next. Fucking Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey started out as Twilight erotic fan fiction posted right. for free on some stupid-ass website. But the woman just rewrote the characters' names and rewrote the settings and released it as a book and now it's being turned into a movie, and it's coming out next month, and I do not want to live in a world where Twilight erotic fan fiction is gripping the nation. You know? I don't want to live in a world where thinly disguised Twilight erotic fan fiction is going to be the number one movie in America, and everybody's going to go nuts over it. That's just sad. It's just sad. Yeah. His smarminess, though, the host smarminess, smarmy, smarm, smarmitude, mm -hmm. reminded me of the Joe Schmo show. Do you remember that? Did you ever see that? I've never seen it. I have heard of it, though. It was when Spike TV first came into existence, and they were trying to be important. 
So they came up with this concept of a fake reality show where everyone is an actor except for one person, and it's like this twisted social experiment reality show. And they only did it for two seasons, but the the second season had uh, Natasha Legero in it, and she's kind of semi-famous. And the first season actually had Kristen Wiig in it before she went to Saturday Night Live, before she started Bridesmaids, like before she became huge. She was in the Joe Schmo show, which is weird. And uh, the host, Ralph Garman, he's now one of the, the – one of uh, – he does a bunch of voices for Family Guy. Right. Uh, he also has a podcast with Kevin Smith. Oh, yeah? Cool. I like uh, Ralph Garman. I like Ralph Garman. But he was the smarmy host. That's who uh, Fake Semen Guy reminded me of. But I would also, I would like to clarify something that he mentions in his tutorial. He yeah. was talking about different color semen you could make. Strawberry, if you want to, wouldn't that be funny? Pause. And he <laughs> talked about and he talked about uh, green colored yogurt, and then he mentioned uh, like maybe for the Hulk. You know, they made an Avengers porn. I wonder if they did that. And then he moves on. Well, I have that porn. And I can tell you that the semen is regular colored. You have that porn? Yes. Cool. I might have to borrow it from you. I, I like the that. Hulk. Like the the Hulk is isn't like in the it. And the Black Widow. Yeah. That's pretty hot. The, yeah, the Hulk isn't in it, but She Hulk is, and mm -hmm. She Hulk is played by China from WWE. Oh, oh yeah, I don't see yeah. her. Yeah, really, and she really, does it with she does it with four. I don't think I could watch her in any any kind of porn or you know. yeah. yeah. But they've done they've actually Vivid, I think, is the company that does it. They've actually started a whole wing just for comic book parodies like that. Oh, oh really? this is a perfect. Nice. Yeah, they've done a uh, uh, an X Men one that's really good, and they've done a Justice League one. And I just got my hands on a Captain America one that's really good. Really? Didn't they also, did they do a Spider-Man? I thought there was a Spider-Man book. Yeah, Spider yeah, Spider-Man. Because there's one with uh, Spider-Man and the Black Widow. Yeah. That's, I mean, like, really, really good. Not, not, to, not to be, like, too <laughs> here, but that has been kind of the porn I've been favoring, and there really isn't all that much of it on YouTube. Yeah. Because straight porn has just pretty much gotten fairly boring. Yeah. With, you know, I mean, I, I, the, the, the audio, I can swear it's all the same girl. Yeah. You know, if you just listen to the audio. Yeah. It sounds like all the same girl just, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you act like you're into it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that this, I think that that's a perfect lead-in to this week's film. Babes in Toyland? Babes in Toyland. Yeah. A wonderful and legendary series of porn movies. Uh, Lesbians with toys. <laughs> Babes in Toyland. They've been making this series of porn since the 90s, and it's still going strong, so really great. Nice. Nice. I thought uh, you were talking about this movie, or did you accidentally watch the wrong one? Oh, you know what? I watch both, so I can do a... <laughs> I watch one a lot more than the other one, but Babes in Toyland is a 1961 Disney live-action musical, and um, this movie is so Disney that it's hard to rip on. Mm -hmm. 
it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, well, it's colorful and it's for kids and it's it's so bright and cute that it's like, okay, well, like I could I could hate this movie, but it, you know, I it's like the movie makes you feel like a dick for hating it. It's kind of like kicking a puppy. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like kicking a puppy or making fun of it's a small world. Like, well, you know, it's easy, but it's so cute. Yeah, you know what, whatever. The movie was directed by Jack Donahue, and I looked this guy up on IMDb, and this guy's credits is basically a, like, 1960s, 1970s time castle. Uh This guy is amazing. He worked on the Frank Sinatra show, the Paul Lind show. He he did uh, the Lucy show. He worked on the Red Skeleton show. He directed a bunch of episodes of The Odd Couple and a bunch of episodes of Chico and the Man. Chico and the Man. I used to love that show. Yeah, this is Jack Donahue, the guy who directed Babes and Toyland. This is uh, he he lived. So Babes in Toyland is loosely based on a 1903 operetta, but despite the fact that it came out like so crazy long ago, this is only the second Babes in Toyland movie that was ever made. The first one is a Laurel and Hardy movie, and apparently it's a classic. And apparently everyone who I talk to um, about this week's movie, they just remember the the 80s one with Drew Barrymore, and uh what's his name? Uh whoa Keanu Reeves. Really? Yeah. That's I, that's I the Babes in Toyland that everybody who I was talked to this week, that's the move that's the one that they remember. I'm like, really? I haven't seen this one? It's got a a Nets in it for Christ's sake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a proto Frankie Avalon. Yeah. He wasn't quite and, uh, Avalon, but and uh, what's his name? Uh, Tommy Kirk. Tommy Kirk. It, it's just it's just always nice to see Tommy Kirk. Okay. Okay. I, Can I you? I was looking through to see if Kurt Russell was in the credits anywhere as like an extra or anything, but no. Yeah. I, I, I was going to look something up, but I forgot to. But Tommy Kirk is in this movie, and he's been in a bunch of movies, and he was in uh, Old Yeller, for Pete's sake, and a a bunch of Disney stuff. But I know Tommy Kirk mainly from that one horrible beach movie that he did that was on Mystery Science Theater during the Joel years. And I keep forgetting what the name of it is. And I said, oh, well, I'll look it up before the podcast. And I totally forgot to. Let's get a look here. But I remember, that's how I know Tommy Kirk, because he's from Arizona in that movie. And because uh, screenwriters have to, like, telegraph things, he's constantly talking about Arizona. (laughs) So he's on the beach, and it's like, this is a nice beach, not like Arizona. And I'm like, ah, oh, shut up about Arizona. Like, hey, Tommy, what do you think about the ocean? Well, it's a lot nicer than Arizona. It's like, shut up about Arizona. I'm from Arizona. And I know that people don't want to constantly hear about it. <laughs> uh, was it possibly pajama party? No. There was no pajamas. It was like a like a wannabe beach movie. It's a bikini world. Oh, I figured it. I just remembered it. Catalina Caper. That was it. Catalina Caper. Okay, there. Catalina is. Caper. Mystery Science Theater movie. So they go to like this like beach party and there's all these chicks and they're dancing and stuff. And he's like, wow, we don't have any parties like this in Phoenix. He's like, oh, God damn it. Stop talking about Phoenix. Because I lived in Phoenix for like 20 years, and then my family moved to Sacramento, and I tried staying in Phoenix as long as I could. And then eventually I moved 
to Sacramento, and my brother was all happy because he was like, oh, you can back me up when we go to the bar. Hey, you can you can hang out with me. Uh, just don't be weird around my friends, all right? You know, just don't mention that you have a church or anything. I don't want I don't want you to weird out my friends. So I meet his friends, and his friends love me. His friends wow. just automatically fall in love with me, and they love that I have a church. And one of the first things they said was, hey, Steve, you're really cool. Can you do us a favor? Can you talk to your brother and get him to stop fucking mentioning Phoenix? <laughs> He's constantly talking about Phoenix, and it's like, we don't want to hear about Phoenix. <laughs> So I remember watching Catalina Caper and going, oh, just fucking stop fucking talking about Phoenix. <laughs> Nobody at this bitch wants to hear about weather in Tempe, for Christ's sake. God. But but in this movie, Babes in Toyland, uh, Tommy Kirk, uh, he was like, what, the toy maker's assistant? Yeah. Uh, well, Groomio, mm-hmm. whom I considered to be the Wesley Crusher of this movie. He definitely was putting out a Wesley, Wesley Crusher vibe. It was like, ah, oh, really here. long time to get to Toyland, though, didn't it? Yes, it does take a really long time to get to Toyland. But, but, Toyland brings up an interesting talking point that I wanted to talk to you about. Okay. There's this thing that happens with me, and I think it happens with everybody, but it's not something that's talked about. And I was trying to come up with like a like a phrase to describe this. I don't think that there's a phrase for it. So I invented my own phrase. I call it mental typecasting. Okay. And it's when there's someone who does this classic role, but you've never seen them in anything else. So they are just that person in your head. Like, um, I knew that the guy who played the dad in The Munsters had been in other things. Uh Uh-huh. I knew that he had a big, long career and that he did a bunch of other things, but in my mind, he was always the dad from the Munsters. So when I saw him as the judge in My Cousin Vinny, I was blown away. I was like, holy crap, is that the dad from the frickin' Munsters? (laughs) Holy shit, that's the dad from the Munsters as the judge. Well, good for him. That blocked the mental typecasting that I had in my mind for him. And there are two really wonderful examples of mental typecasting that occur in the movie Bathed in Toyland. For starters, the bad guy Barnaby, yes, Mr. Barnaby, is played by Ray Bolger, the scarecrow from fucking Wizard of Oz. Yes, and, and just from those two roles, you really can't tell that it's him. Yeah. You can't tell that it's him. Occasionally you can see it in his face and his just like over-exaggerated facial expression. But I have never seen him in anything else. Yeah. Other than these two movies. And I've seen The Wizard of Oz like a goddamn bajillion times, but I've never seen him in anything else. And it really like, oh, wait, that's the freaking Scarecrow. And you got to think like, okay, well, sure, he was the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. I imagine he had a career. I imagine he's been in other movies. It's pretty much statistically impossible that his one and only film is freaking Wizard of Oz. He probably had a career, but all I know him in my head is as the goddamn Scarecrow. Mm -hmm. So it really meant a lot to me to great that. not help thinking about him in this particular movie Gay Dracula. Gay Dracula. Yeah. Because he was putting That'd be a great kind of a movie. Dracula, he was putting off kind of a Dracula vibe, but the whole purple lining in his black cape was really giving him quite a bit of a fabulous look. Uh, I just disappointed myself. How so? 
I, I was going to say a uh, gay Dracula. That would make a really good movie. But then I realized they already made that movie, and it's called Interview with the Vampire. <laughs> yes. I'm like, oh, okay. it's like, oh man, gay, gay Dracula. Wouldn't that be? Oh well, shit, they already did that. <laughs> oh well, crap. The other major bit of mental typecasting that happens in this film is this is the first time I've ever seen Ed win in anything other than as the voice of the Mad Hatter in Disney's Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I am sure I've seen him in a lot of things, but what they are now, I can't even think of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm I'm sure I may have seen him in other things, but but yeah, he, I in my mind though I have typecasted him as just the Mad Hatter, and uh, I I've just been I've been obsessed with Alice in Wonderland, Disney's Alice in Wonderland since I was a kid. I just absolutely love that movie. I think it's just the best. And I've recently um, solved a little mystery about the movie for myself that I'm really happy about. All right, what so? Because I even when I was a little kid and I didn't know anything about animated movies or voiceover acting or general film production, when I would watch the movie as a child, I would always notice that the Mad Hatter's voice sounds completely different than the March Hare's voice in the sense that the March Hare sounds like he's recording in a studio and the Mad Hatter sounds like he's in an empty, abandoned church somewhere saying his line. They always sounded completely different quality-wise, and I always thought that was odd. Well, as it turns out, Edwin is an old-time vaudevillian actor. So... What they did was, in order to get his facial expressions and his mannerism for the Mad Hatter character, they filmed him doing the scene in a studio in front of the cast and crew, and he nailed it. He was hilarious, and people absolutely loved it. But then when they brought him into the studio to record his lines, he was horrible. And that's because being an old vaudevillian actor, he was much better playing in front of people than he was being in a studio alone by himself. Yeah. So they ripped the audio recording from when he performed in a big empty studio in front of people and put that as his dialogue, whereas everyone else in that scene is recording in the studio. Hmm. I realized that recently, and it's like, wow, I just discovered a mystery that, like, my eight-year-old self was wondering about. How interesting is that? <laughs> it might not be interesting to anybody else, but it's interesting to me. I went to the Oklahoma M Museum of History right, uh, in like a year or two on a field trip. And I didn't care, because I don't really care about Oklahoma, but they had a section for Oklahoma film history. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll go in here, but it's just, it's going to be crap. What are they going to talk about? The musical Oklahoma and the filming of The Outsiders, and that's it. Like, I'm not going to give a crap about this. But once you went in, it was all set up as an old-timey drive-in, and they had an old car, and you sat in it, and there was a big projector and fake crickets and fake stars, and I was really blown away by it. And they had a history of bad movies filmed in Oklahoma, like uh, the Slime People and stuff like that. I was a teenage werewolf, I think, and some other ones. And then you went, and they, they talked at length about all of the different movies, and I was really blown away by some of them, like... Uh, Vidal Yankovic's UHF. Uh-huh. And uh, a couple of other ones. And then they had a series of um, of um, looks at famous people who, from Oklahoma that went to make movies. And there was a big Alice in Wonderland section. And I thought, well, this is odd. But apparently 
you know, there were a lot of um, animators that helped Walt Disney in the early days of making Disney animated movies. And they're almost all guys and old white men who smoked cigars and were assholes. But there was one woman, and she was from Oklahoma, and her name was Mary Blair. And she was responsible for the look of pretty much all of the classic Disney animated movies. And they weren't sure how to go about doing Alice in Wonderland. So then she said, okay, well, let me take a crack at it. And she did the basic drawings and color designs and outlines for how it would look. And it was so beautiful that they based the movie off of her drawing. So she was kind of the person who gave birth to Disney's Alice in Wonderland. So I'm, I'm in love with her. She, she also helped create my favorite Disney animated movie, The Three Caballeros. Because there should be more Disney animated movies that feature cigar smoking and cockfighting. I I I would tend to agree. Well, just in general, there isn't enough cockfighting anymore. Yeah, there isn't enough cockfighting. Yeah, yeah. This so, was this was Walt Disney's attempt, apparently, to make an Oz style film. And since this was made in 1961, then that means that The Wizard of Oz was successful by then. Because The Wizard of Oz came out in 1939, but a little thing called War happened, and it bombed. And it didn't start to make money until 1949, because it had been released, re-released, and re-re-re-re-released numerous times. It first started showing on TV in 1956, and they started showing it during the holidays and eventually became a holiday tradition. And the closest thing I can think of to a modern-day Wizard of Oz is a Christmas story. The Red uh, Rider BB gun and yeah. you'll shoot your eye out and all that. Because I don't remember anyone caring about that movie when it came out. Christmas story? Yeah, no. Yeah. Only when whatever, whatever station it was just ran it on a loop. That's yeah. really kind of where it seems to have gotten popular. Yeah. But, so, Walt Disney tried tried so hard to turn Babes in Toyland into, like, the next Wizard of Oz. He even went so far as to cast the goddamn Scarecrow in this. <laughs> But this is a lot like The Wizard of Oz in the sense that they're both sort of epic and lush and sort of like a sweeping epic family film. But there is one drastic difference between The Wizard of Oz and Babes in Toyland. And the difference is the music in The Wizard of Oz, you will remember five seconds after hearing it. Right. You will not do that with the music in Babes in Toyland. You're not going to find yourself an hour after seeing this movie humming Little Bo Peep's I've Lost My Sheep song. Yes. Yes. I mean, the music is just... Appreciate the Annette Funicello I Am Really Stupid song. Oh, you mean the girls can't do math because they're stupid song? Exactly, yes. <laughs> I like that song because it's so sexist. It, it was it was very much like, you know, um, you really need to find a man because you're not going to make it on your own. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was... I just, I just can't figure out math because I'm a girl. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I thought that that was entertaining, but it wasn't catchy. It wasn't. No, I mean there there are no real tapping. Yeah, there are no standout songs in this sort of thing. The only 
song that comes close to really standing out is the March of the Wooden Soldiers, and that that's that isn't even. I mean, they took that. Mm-hmm. Is the scene at the end? That's the only thing that that is really like, oh hey. You really do need to go on YouTube and now check out March of the Wooden Soldiers because it is really a much superior movie to this. Uh, even though they <coughs> tried to get in there, their kind of mock Laurel and Hardy characters. Yep. And when we were watching it over Christmas, Jeannie pointed out something that, that I didn't pick up on immediately. Uh, because those two characters were Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And in true Disney insensitivity, yeah. Dumb didn't speak. Because, well, huh. he was dumb. <laughs> yeah. You huh. know, so they, they took the opportunity to mock a handicap. You know. Yeah. So I thought that was that was pretty interesting. Uh, but there was definitely there to be Laurel and Hardy standing. Speaking of Disney insensitivity, when you see the gypsies for the first time, I kept thinking, okay, is this racist? Or is it what not racist? What I is it was not wondering is, because this is the kind of thing that we've always sort of heard about, you know, selling people to the gypsies and things like that. And uh, I I find, I I just don't get it. You know, what do the gypsies want with these people? You know, um, they're not putting them into slavery, it seems, because whenever somebody is sold to the gypsies and come back, the only thing that's really happened to them is that they dance really well. Yeah. You know? So... Are gypsies just buying people to teach them how to dance? Like that Is song. That it? Like mm-hmm. that song. You broke my heart because I couldn't dance. You didn't yeah. even want me around. But now I'm back to let you know that you're a fucking bitch. <laughs> And that's a really horrible reason to break up with someone. Mm -hmm. My first girlfriend broke up with me because I wouldn't sing her a touching ballad. You wouldn't sing her a touching ballad? You should have sung her a touching ballad. She said that if I really loved her, then I would sing to her. So then she broke up with me. But then I got her to go back. This was eighth grade. So then I got her to get back with me if I promised to sing her a song. So then I sang her Wicked Games by Chris Isaac, and then she got upset that I didn't sing it loud enough and broke up with me again. Oh, okay. And to this day, I hate Chris Isaac. But I thankfully, he's blame here. Yeah, thankfully, though, he's not that culturally relevant anymore. He's like yeah. Michael Bolton. So there's not too much. I wonder if Chris Isaac was, like, really into shuffleboard or something like that. Like Michael Bolton was into softball. Maybe Chris Isaac is just, like... I like to think now that every major every major musician has, like, this one sport that they're really into. And, like, Dave yeah. Matthews is playing all these colleges and stuff, and, and he's like, yeah, but I've got a really important ping-pong game tomorrow. (laughs) Bowling. Somebody would have to be a bowler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, Metallica is doing some big arena tour, but it's like, come on, guys, let's focus. We have an important volleyball game tomorrow. (laughs) I I, I would like to hope now. I would like to hope that 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 is true. Yeah. 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 And every cuz I always felt that I always felt that when it came to celebrities, every celebrity who's famous for something really wants to do something else. Yeah. 
like a lot of musicians want to be actors. A lot, a lot of actors want to be musicians. A lot of comedians want to be musicians. And I always felt like, okay, well, this kind of explains that. Let's just all switch roles, apparently, because that would explain uh, Bruce Willis's uh, musical phase. Bruno? Oh, good Lord. And would explain why I'm still occasionally seeing, like, uh, Andre 3000 from Outcast in movies. He was just in that horrible, we're going to make a movie about Jimi Hendrix, but we can't use the music movie, <laughs> which is just ridiculous. Yeah. Like, hey, we're gonna make a we're gonna make a movie about the Doors, but we can't call them the Doors, and you can't use any of the Doors music. <laughs> and we can't call him Jim Morrison. Yeah. But this week's movie, Bays in Toyland, what did you think about it? Uh, I do not like Bays in Toyland, but I, I think it's one of those things that, that everybody should see at least once. Uh, I, 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 I may be kind of snobby about this, but again, March of the Wooden Soldiers is, is just a much, much better movie. Very much the same story. But everything about Marching <clears throat> the Soldiers is beautiful. You know, it, I mean, there's so much work in that movie to make it look interesting for, for a black and white movie. The sets are incredible. Um, this looks like Disney was barely even trying. You know? Um, yeah. It's, it's very low key. The actors aren't, like, even really excited about their roles or anything like that. You know, it's just sort of there. You know? Yeah. The, the jokes for what they were were kind of on the predictable side. Mm-hmm. You know? So, um, not a huge fan. I'm kind of glad it exists because it makes me appreciate the other movie more. Yeah. Well, I have a very small list of musicals that are good. It's not a big list. Yeah. I did think it was a very good example of music, so musicals of that period, though. You know, very spooky, yeah. very, you know, a lot of people dancing and yeah, you know, breaking into song for no reason. Yeah. Okay, I've got my list here of good musicals. Let me think. Okay. Um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Not Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but Willy Wonka. Freaking Gene Wilder. Uh, for an odd reason, I don't even think of, I don't think of that movie as a musical. But now oh, but it absolutely is, is, though, when you really think about it. Yeah. Cheer up, Charlie. Give um, me a smile. Great movie. I don't know if I could really say great musical music. <laughs> I recognize it as a musical. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's one of those it's one of those musicals where it's like, oh wait, this is a musical. Mm-hmm. Uh, Guys and Dolls. I love Guys and Dolls. Not exactly I, sure why, but I love Guys and Dolls. Yeah. I have not seen that in like a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. There's just something about it. It's just colorful and criminals and gambling and I, I really like it. it. Just the musical in general, not even, you know... Just, I like the musical in general, and then you add Marlon Brando and Frank Sinatra to it. It's, it, it, I like it. Yeah. Um, anything by Matt, uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone. Or is it Matt Parker and Trey Stone? No, yeah. It's Trey Parker and Matt Stone. The South Park guys. Yes. Anything by them. So. Well, the only, well, obviously South Park. Although I yeah. do not watch South Park very often, 
Um, Cannibal the uh, Musical. Cannibal the Musical, and uh, I, I find myself often having a short, short day. Uh, yeah. And Team America World Police. Team America World Police. Yeah. I hear and that also, the government is doing really well, but I have. Yeah. Of course, I've not it, it's, that yet. Some, of the, some of the songs on there are just absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, and uh, another one on my list of good musicals. <laughs> uh, Repo the Genetic Opera. Repo. I, I so many people want to do attack that movie. I, I really do like it. I think a lot of people attack that movie just because that fucking bitch is in it. Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton. And there are some people out there that just cannot get themselves to like anything that has anything to do with Paris Hilton. But I defend that by saying. Well, Taylor Tilden is the movie, but she's playing a stuck-up, conceited, rich bitch. Right. So it what it, it is the part she was born to play, literally. Mm-hmm. But when you get past the fact that Paris Hilton is in this movie, it's a wonderful musical. And beyond that, one or two of the songs are pretty catchy. Specifically, a song called Thy Great Anatomy made its way onto my phone about uh, five years ago, where it has stayed, and it's on a fairly heavy, it's on a big, I've got about 1,500 songs on my phone, and that song is one of them. But it's played enough that if that song comes on, my kids will know what that song is. They will sing along to it. My kids know that Zydrape comes in a little glass vial, and the little glass vial goes into the gun like the batter, like a battery. My kids know that. <laughs> and I'm really proud of that. That's a I crazy, also, catchy song. Yeah, I also think that it had a problem because as it was coming out, as hype was started building for it, pretty much everybody was kind of wanting it to be Rocky Horror, and it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm glad it wasn't Rocky Horror. It's just another kind of offbeat musical. And I'm yeah. fine with that. I like that movie a lot. So. Rocky Horror, that's another one that's on my list. That's Rocky another Horror. one that's on my list. Yeah. For a long time, I would go to see Rocky Horror at the at the, the Tempe Theater, the Tempe Art Theater that was there on Mill Avenue in Tempe. I would go and see it every Saturday at midnight. I knew people that were in the cast. I knew everybody who was it, who would go and see that. It was always yeah. sold out. I would constantly be going to see Rocky Horror. But the thing was was that eventually I didn't want to hear the people yelling. I just wanted to watch the movie. Yeah. It got to the point where it's like, hey, let's yell and make fun of this movie. Let's just yell at the screen. And eventually it's it just I just started looking around and I'm like, this is a, a theater full of people trying to be louder than everyone else. Mm-hmm. This is just a theater of ostentatious people. Let me pay attention to the movie now. And when I did that, I, I really just fell in love with the movie. I love the movie and I love the music and just that opening number is just perfect. This but it was a great feeling when you got off a good line when we, you were watching Rocky Horror. Yeah. If you shouted out something that was completely original, and you got an audience reaction. That was good. Feeling. My brother would ruin everyone's night at Rocky Horror because uh, the the time warp starts with. Frankenfurter opening up a coffin and there's a dead body there. Right. Right before he starts, it's astounding. And everybody in the audience, they know that it's, that the song's about to start and they all start getting excited and they can't wait to stand up and start dancing. But he opens that coffin and that's weird. So my brother would always yell out, show us, and then whoever famous just died that everybody loved. Okay. <laughs> like right now it would be like 
show us John Rivers. Yeah. yeah. Or show us Robin Williams. <laughs> and he would open up the coffin and just the sound of a theater full of people, their hearts crumbling. It was just a magical thing, just an ocean of, oh. I, I, I think I like that. I think I like that a lot, actually. Yeah, just an ocean of people that would just go, oh. And just to see everyone in front of us turn and look like a puppy had just been beaten, it was just a magical thing. <laughs> The one that he almost got, he almost got his ass beat the one time because there was a, a legendary kids show that played in Phoenix from like the 1950s to the, to like the early 1990s. And it played forever and it was the Wallace and Ladmo show. And everyone in Arizona knew the Wallace and Ladmo show and Ladmo had just died. And my brother just got all excited. I can't wait to go to Rocky Horror. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break everyone in half. He just got so excited, and I'm like, dude, dude, this is Wallace and Ladmo. You can't do this. They will lynch you. They will tar and feather you. They will murder you. Oh, but when he did it, there was just. There was just yelling and tears, and he almost got kicked out of the theater. It was just magical. It's amazing to see, like, okay, this is a Rocky Horror audience. Okay, now, what will offend a Rocky Horror audience? That's what my brother would go for. Cool. Yeah. We would always end Rocky Horror Picture Show, me and my group of people, we would always end the show in our own special way. Because we were all obsessed with Rocky Horror, but we were also obsessed with Clue. And Clue does not get the recognition that it deserves, because that's an amazing movie. That also I features Tim have Curry. I Clue since it came out. I, it, it's an amazing movie, and especially because the when they finally released the movie, because I thought when it came out, and when it came out, there were three different endings, yes. and they would be playing at different theaters, and it was amazing. And we picked the we picked the theater that was playing ending one, and we didn't know what ending one was. But then a week later, we went to the other side of town and saw ending two, and we were like, "Oh wow, this is a completely different movie at the end. How amazing is that?" So when they released it in the, when they released it on DVD and video and stuff like that, they put every ending at the end of the movie, and it's really amazing. And now I have to tell my kids, hey, you know, this isn't how it was. You would pick different endings and stuff like that. But we would end when we would go see Rocky Horror. At the end of Rocky Horror, we would stand up and we would be the last people in the theater, and we would say the line from the third ending of Clue, we would stand up and go, okay, Chief, take him away. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. <laughs> and then we would walk out of the theater and and then uh, eventually make our way to a Denny. But... <laughs> God, I miss Rocky Horror. My daughter... Uh, my oldest daughter, Emerald, she has a friend who's obsessed with Rocky Horror. And she's like, she keeps wanting me to watch Rocky Horror. She keeps wanting me to ro watch Rocky Horror, and I'm not sure if I should. And I'm like, you shouldn't. You should wait until you can see it in, an, in a theater with an audience. You can't just sit down and blindly watch this movie. You'll have no idea what the context is. You won't know what to expect. You'll be, it'll be, no, it's too soon. You're 13. You gotta wait until you can see it with a bunch of angry, possibly drugged up people in some dirty theater somewhere, and you're all yelling at the screen. Mm -hmm. So she went to to a slumber party with her friend, and of course they watched it. And so Emerald came back, and I think she was 12 at the time, and she's like, 
I watched Rocky Horror. I'm not sure if I liked it. I'm like, no! That's not how you're supposed to watch it! <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Eventually, I'm going to have to find some place nearby to take her. She'll be scarred for life, but... You're supposed to be in the theater, and you, you need to be on various mind-altering substances. Yeah. That's really the only way to uh, watch Rocky Horror. Yeah. I'll have to wait until she gets older. Yeah. Because he's only 13 now, so I might have to wait. You also but anyway, Babes in Toyland. Babes in Toyland, yes. Yeah. It was it was cute. It was all right. I watched it with Maxwell on my chest, and I think it says something that Maxwell kept saying. Okay, so what's going on? <laughs> like ten minutes later. Oh, Daddy, what's it? What is this? Okay, Daddy, so what's going on? Daddy, who is that? For the most part, through most of the movie, nothing much was going on. Yeah. So, I, I can understand his point of view there. Yeah, there's not there's not much that's happening here. It's yeah. a bit it's a bit of an odd film. <laughs> But I, I I liked it well enough. I liked it okay. I I I don't I don't hate it. Yeah. I don't hate it. It's kind of close. You know, uh, some of the worst animation I've ever seen. It's okay, but it's it's unremarkable. It's uh, if I were to describe it, I would end up describing it the same way that the residents of Bricksburg described Emmett, the construction worker, in the beginning of the Lego movie. You know, it's just, there's nothing, there's nothing important happening there. It's just kind of a clean slate. Yeah. Have you seen the Lego movie? I have not seen the Lego movie yet. It's ridiculously amazing. It really is an amazing movie. It, it You don't want to see it because you think, oh, well, this is a movie about Legos. This is going to be horrible. But they somehow made it into an amazing, hilarious, wonderful film. Yeah. And they, they put an ending in there, which is kind of shocking. Really? Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's a bizarre... It's a bizarre, shocking sort of ending, where Emmett, the hero, he he falls out of Bricksburg and meets God, who happens to be like an eight-year-old boy who is playing with the Legos. Okay. It's 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 really weird. But just like Emmett is fighting Lord Business who wants to control everybody, the eight year old kid is playing with his dad's Legos and his dad doesn't want him messing with his stuff. Just leave my stuff alone. These are my Legos. You can't touch any of these. These are mine. It's really weird. It's it's a surprisingly uh it's an amazing ending for a kids movie. Yeah. That does sound it. I, I have not I haven't heard that, that was the ending. Well the people who made the movie also did Twenty One Jump Street, which I also unfortunately really, really like. These guys, they're a team, these two dudes. They do a really good job. They do a really good job of getting old, old, uh, things that people don't care about and turning them into really, really good movies. Yeah. 
I, I, I know I was surprised that they were doing a 21 Jump Street movie. That sounded really kind of a bizarre to me. Because it was an okay show, you know. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. But it, it, it 21 wasn't, it Jump Street. Anything on, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 21 Jump Street is a hilarious movie. It, it is, uh, and I really appreciated uh, Johnny Depp coming back and yeah. doing it. You know, where he yeah. could have, you know, like if he didn't, did I see this on this podcast before? I'm not sure. Like if he didn't do anything, you know, if he was just like, yeah. oh, it's funny, it's funny, it's funny, and he didn't do any kind of cameo, then he would have been a big douchebag. Okay? If he... <laughs> But he, he could have gotten away with just kind of Stan lee it. Yeah. You know? Uh, but he really went above and beyond the call of duty. And especially with getting Peter DeLuise in there, it was just such a such kind of a flashback moment. And it was like, yeah, you know, those guys really were pretty cool. Yeah. He, he didn't have to go that far, but he did. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think he deserves a lot of respect for that. Yeah. I um, I liked this week. I liked watching a Disney animated movie. And not mm-hmm. Disney animated movie. We've done a Disney animated movie. And now we've done a Disney live action musical. Yeah. Um, but I have an idea for next week. What do you think for next week? Um, well, I I thought that it would be really good because this week was a very nice and safe uh, Disney musical. Right. That for the week following that, next week, to do the absolute opposite the absolute opposite of this week. So I was trying to think of what the absolute opposite of this week would be, and I came up with two movies. Number one, the 1963 Herschel Gordon Lewis film Blood Feast. It's on YouTube. Uh, cannibalism. It's it's a wonderful movie. It's essentially I have seen the- Blood Feast before. Um- like a it's essentially the first film where like a like a director is like, I've got this idea. It's never been done before, but hear me out. I call it gore. Yeah, you know, right? like gore, what's that? It's like a horror movie except we show a bunch of stuff. And everybody's like, What? Nobody will want to see that. That's never been done before. Like, I know. This movie will be the first. And essentially, that's Blood Feast. But as much as I love Blood Feast, it's like an hour long and an hour and nine minutes, I think, and it's yeah, cheap it's easy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He followed that up with a film in 1964 called 2000 Maniacs, which yeah, is also like, like, like the second gore film to ever be released. But... It's also kind of sort of one of the first twisted southern redneck movies ever made. And I think it's much better than Blood Feast. So I was thinking Blood Feast... It's a lot more fun than Blood Feast. Yeah. So I was thinking either Blood Feast or 2000 Maniacs or a double feature. Let's see... They're both available on the YouTube. I just put them on my uh, cult movie playlist on my YouTube page. Yeah. Cool. I am not seeing the full movie. For which? I just found it a couple of hours ago and I put it on my singing mabobber. 
my thingy majigger. Where is your thingy majigger? <clears throat> I believe it's either Reverend Steve or Reverend Steve G. There's a playlist that I specifically have for full cult movies. Okay. And I just put in both Blood Thief and 2000 Maniacs on there. There were two full-length versions of 2000 Maniacs that I found. One was in Spanish, which I thought was odd. And the other one was the full movie. It was just the uh, and, and in English, and it was... Also like the fact that while I'm talking about these Herschel Gordon Lewis movies, I'm building Legos with my three-year-old son. There's something awesome about that. Right, Maxwell? Yeah. Maxwell, say, Daddy is awesome. Daddy is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> 2,000 maniacs. Not seeing it on the front page. Going to videos. Seeing a bucket of blood there. Oh yeah, it's not on my front page. It's it's on the playlist. Maybe if you do a search for full for a full cult movies, Reverend Steve's playlist or something like that. I don't know. Like, I love Blood Feast. That's a fun movie, but 2000 Maniacs, it, it, you're right. It is just more fun. Yeah, I'm not finding it there anywhere, but it is. It is. I have found it on YouTube. Okay. So people will be able to look it up there, and there is the Spanish version. This is not the Spanish version, so, yeah. It's, it's a lot more fun. It has a little bit more comedy to it, where yeah. Blood Feast is trying and failing to be serious. But then I figured, well, you know, they're both not long movies anyway, and Blood Feast is a bit of a small one. We could do both. Like a bloody double feature. 2,000 Maniacs? That's, yeah, that's uh, an hour 23. Yeah, let's do it. Sweet. Next week is a double feature. Yeah. Blood Feast and 2,000 Maniacs. <laughs> Sometimes I just can't get that opening song out of my head from 2,000 Maniacs. Oh, the South's gonna rise again. <laughs> Sometimes I think of that song here in Oklahoma because I'm worried that all of these, uh, that... Sometimes I'm worried that I've accidentally run into a twisted redneck who's going to come and kill me. Yeah. That's that's part of my... always a fear of mine, yeah. 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 It's always a fear of mine here. And especially especially being from New York where they really didn't like us at all. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get Jeannie prepared for this. I've been wanting her to see a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. Um, she she is not a movie person. You know? Yeah. So I am trying to. I've been trying to give her a a movie education. A movication. Yeah. And <laughs> Herschel Gordon Lewis is definitely something that. She's going to have to experience it or later. Because he did start a whole brand new thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So they call him even... they they call him the godfather of gore. And I really do think that like he was the first person to be like, Hey, what if we have this movie where this guy murders people and they go, Okay, it's like but how about we actually show it? Like, what? No one's ever done that before. It's like, well, what if we do? <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So that blood piece is really like, like the first, like, the first putting your foot into a pond, you know? Mm-hmm. 
Like, there are so many, so many movies that could not exist without this movie first existing. And he would he would get, like, R ratings and things like that because there was no precedent for movies yeah. of this type to know what to do with them. Yeah. I think Blood Feast was an X, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'd have to look through the history. I, I'm not sure if it was an X. <clears throat> but we can touch on that next week during our bloody double feature. Exactly. That's going to be fun. What you need to do with Genie is movie ninja her. I am really good at movie ninjaing people. Movie ninja? I'll be sitting, okay. Yeah. I'll be sitting on the couch, and Emerald's sitting on the couch, and she's reading a book, and I'll just grab... Talladega Nights and put it on the DVD player and press play and see what happens. And suddenly Emerald's reading a book and then occasionally looking up. And then Emerald's reading a book and then looking up a little more. And then eventually Emerald's putting down the book (laughs) and just watching the movie. And then about halfway through the movie, she looks at me and realizes it and goes, Damn it, you movie ninja'd me. And I go, I know. <laughs> movie ninjas work in silence. <laughs> the best the best movie ninja that I ever did, my wife and I, we were fighting and we hated each other and we were just like mad, angry, pissed off at each other. And she came into the room and I was in the room and we weren't talking with each other and and, and she just, she hated me, and I hated her, and I'm like, like, she's coming into this room, fine. Fine. I guess we're going to be here in the same room. You know what? I'm going to put on the room, and I put on the room, the room. The, the room. The and I room. put it on, and I'm like, this is a perfect time for me to watch the room. So she's reading her book in silence and then occasionally looking up. And then she's reading her book and just, who the fuck talks like this? Who is this guy? And I'm like, that's Tommy We Snow. What country is he from? No one knows. Does he have a lazy eye? I think so. It definitely looks that way. But like I said before, no one knows. <laughs> and then eventually she's just like like glued to the TV because she can't believe that there's a movie this bad. I, I, oh I, my god. I'm that. I'm gonna have it's gonna have to become a priority at some point. What makes the movie so amazing is not how bad it is, because it is really bad, but that you can honestly, you you honestly feel like the man who stars in it thinks he's making the greatest movie of all time. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it so bad. Not just the bad acting and the bad special effects and the like, the, the bad green screen special effects. But that while he's saying every line, he really does think that this is going to be the next Gone with the Wind. Yeah. It really is something that... Now he says he thinks it's parody, but, you know, at the time, he he, he definitely bought his own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, this movie is a live action... is a real-life version of a a mockumentary movie that's available on Netflix, and it's really cute and sweet. It, no one's ever heard of it, and and there's really no information about it on on the Internet. But it's a movie called And God Spoke. And it's a fake documentary about a making of a fake Bible movie. And in the beginning, they think they're making the greatest movie, but at the end, they're just struggling to make it and they've ran out of money and they've ran out of the distributor and a studio and they're just struggling to make it and when it comes out in theaters it's the worst movie of all time but then a year later it's playing at midnight in all of these theaters and everyone loves it and of course the people who created the movie are talking about well we always wanted to do a comedy 
And there is so much comedy in the Bible. And we thought, what a, what a great comedy the Bible would be. That's essentially what Tommy We Snow, We So, is doing. He really did think that this was going to be the next Rebel Without a Cause. But then when it became a comedy, he said, oh, yes, I always thought I'd be making a comedy. <laughs> but And God Spoke is a really cute movie, and it's essentially the making of The Room before The Room came out. It's a cute little watch. You should search for it on Netflix and put it on your queue and one day watch it. And it's just it's a cute, adorable little movie about how movies become bad movies. I accidentally watched it one day on, like, the Independent Film Channel. Yeah. And I bought it on DVD, and I'm a big champion of the movie. But, yeah, no one's heard of it, and I don't know if it ever came out in theaters, and there's no real fan pages for it or anything, and there's really no information on the Internet about the, the directors or what they did or if they followed it up with anything. As far as I know, this is like a one-movie bizarre fluke that happened. But if you like bad movies, this is a like a must-watch film. It is in my queue. Sweet. It's, it's cute. It's really, really cute. And, I and the, the only big name that I could think that's in the movie is uh, Andy Dick is in the movie. And he's yeah. being hired. He's hired as uh, Abel in the Cain and Abel story. But apparently he doesn't know his Bible. He's like, I guess I'm playing Abel. Do you know the story of Cain and Abel? It's the first murder, and I'm ready to kill somebody. <laughs> and then for Cain, they get Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, it, and Andy Dick's trying to be all bad, like going around Lou Ferrigno, like, you ready? You ready for this? It, it's just, it's really silly and stupid, but I, I, I'm in love with it. It's my own cute little movie crush. <laughs> Do you have any homework planned for this week? I have no homework planned for this week. I have no homework. But uh, we are doing a double feature, so it's okay to not have homework because we have a double yeah. feature. Yeah. But I'll think of some really good homework for next week. Okay. We will do that. I liked this episode. Mental typecasting. I've got a, I've got, I've got a, I've got a bit of homework. Okay. Um, try and think of some examples of mental typecasting that have happened in your life. I've got one right now. Um, I was watching. I think I may have mentioned this in another podcast, but I was watching The Addams Family, and there was an episode where Morticia's mom showed up, Grandma Frump, and it was played by uh, the Wicked Witch of the West. And I know she's an actress, and she's been in a bunch of things, but I've never seen her in anything else other than the Wicked Witch of the West. So she was typecast in my mind as the Wicked Witch of the West. And I was yeah. so excited to see her as Grandma Frump in the in, a, a random episode of The Addams Family because I was able to free her from the mental typecasting in my mind. <laughs> See, I don't know, man. I, I, when when I start thinking about mental typecasting, which I have not thought about until you brought it up, um, what it makes me think of is when you could swear somebody <laughs> is in a movie and it's not that person at all. Yeah. Uh, gee, what would be a good example of this? Man, I can't think of any, anything. But you just... Yeah, I, don't have, I don't have homework. Mental typecasting is a difficult thing to wrap your head around. Yeah. Another one is uh, when I when I finally sat down and watched Dr. Seuss's one and only movie. Have you seen Dr. Seuss's movie? Dr. Seuss's movie? I don't it, Dr. Seuss's anthology. 
No, Dr. Seuss made an actual movie, wrote the script, and helped with the sets and the 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 costume. It's called The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, and it's just an absolutely bizarre movie. The sets look exactly how you'd expect. The, the, the costuming looks exactly how you'd expect for a Dr. Seuss movie, and it's about this kid, and he... He hates his piano teacher, and so he he imagines this magical world where his piano teacher is like this evil supervillain who is kidnapping children to play his 5,000-keyed super piano. And the bad guy, Dr. T, in the movie is played by the actor who does the voice for Captain Hook in Peter Pan. And apparently the look for Captain Hook was also based on this guy because he looks just like Captain Hook. And he sounds Anne's, just like Anne's Captain Connery. Hook. Huh? Hans Connery, I'm pretty sure, did the uh, voice of Captain Hook. Yeah. Who was on the old Danny Thomas show. And, and again, just like Edwin, hundreds and hundreds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I had never seen him in anything else. But when I saw him in The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, I, that's when I was able to free him from the mental typecasting in my mind because all I knew him was as the voice of Captain Hook. But suddenly I'm like, oh, my God, that's Captain Hook. Holy crap. How did he come over here? Captain Hook's in this freaking movie. <laughs> Just like I did with uh, Ed Wynn in today's movie. Yeah. Like, holy crap, that's the... That's a mad hatter, for Christ's sake. <laughs> we don't have parties like these in Phoenix. Freaking Tommy Kirk. <laughs> he looks a he, lot he like was, Wesley Crusher. He does, and but he was created in Mars Needs Women. <laughs> yes, Mars Needs Women. All right, so next week... Do you think he's still, like, keeps in contact with Kurt Russell? You know, do you, do you think they're all, like, old war buddies from having been Disney kids? I like to think, think so. he's reached out to Miley Cyrus? Uh... Do you think Kurt maybe gave her a call and said, you know... I understand I was a Disney kid too, but put your tongue back in your mouth. Maybe not Disney kids, but I bet that Miley Cyrus could get together with uh, some of the other kids from like Nickelodeon and stuff like that. Like I thought, like Miley Cyrus has hosted Saturday Night Live and Keenan Thompson is on Saturday Night Live. And he was on all that on Nickelodeon in like the early '90s, and he had his own show, the Keenan and the uh, yeah, the Keenan and Kel show uh-huh. on Nickelodeon. And I thought when Miley Cyrus hosted, I thought, oh, I wonder if they if they get together and talk about being uh, child stars together. I would think it would have to come up in conversation sometime. Yeah. Like, oh, what was it like working with Disney? Oh, well, this is what it was like working with Nickelodeon. Amanda Bynes, that's what I was trying to think of. Amanda Bynes had her own show on Nickelodeon, too, and now she's like some weird, cracked-out, crazy person. Yeah. So I imagine she can also hang out with Miley Cyrus. Amanda Bynes, I had such a crush on her when I was, like, in junior high and high school. And now she's yes, a yeah. crack whore. <laughs> she is a crack whore. <laughs> uh, tell us about your website, tell us about story time, and tell us about your religion. Um, story time and my religion? Well... My religion is good. 
and my story times are good. My religion is at edwood.org, and you should go to it because it's awesome. It's been there since uh, 1996, and um, it'll change your life or give you a laugh either way. And my story times, I do story time once a week uh, with uh, a certain corporation. Mm-hmm. That I, whose name I don't want to mention right now, but just to be safe, it rhymes with Florence and Nurbles. Uh huh. But I've been doing story time with them once a week for pretty much about eleven years. Nice. And that's pretty crazy. Hmm. Like 11 or 12 years of doing story time. That's pretty insane for one person to do. Yeah. But my story times have really been taking off lately. I get about 20 or 30 kids a week, and they're loud and crazy. And, yeah, they're absolutely insane. Sometimes I just like to try and end stories early by telling the kids that everyone just exploded. (laughs) And then they all explode at the end. Well, yeah, I know that didn't happen, but I made it happen, and I can do that because I'm the storyteller. Now we can move on. Was it hard for them in Oklahoma to pick up on story time and what story time was like really about? Um, yeah, yeah, it I, it was easier in California to be the the like crazy ass storyteller who's messing with the kids and being loud and stuff. It yeah. took a bit longer for people to be okay with that, but it really does seem to be taking off because I'm getting, a, a you know, a lot more people. Like two or three weeks ago, I had like 40-something people show up, and it was it was just a like a big event sort of thing. Nice. So, so, yeah, I'm getting a bunch of people and a bit of press, and that's good because I've been doing it for so long. So, and also the corporation is is starting to realize that these story times put butts in seats. So, you know, they're giving me more things to to help me do this better. So it's all a big win win for everybody. So you should go on Facebook and like. Story time with Mr. Steve. There are two pages. One of them is a page to like my story times in California, and it's old, and apparently I can't delete it because Facebook sucks ass. That one only has, like, about 20 or 30 likes. Then there's one that has 135 likes, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it's awesome, and you should like that. I think I've been sharing Um, the correct one in that case. (laughs) Yes, you have. I'm done. I'm done plugging. Um, go to my YouTube page on Dead Cow Film. Uh, Bob's Dirty Shorts, the director's cut, <laughs> is going to be launching tomorrow. Sweet! And this is really going to be something to watch. If you like the short ones, you know, the short bobs, they're still going to be going up. They're going to be going up daily for two years. Uh, that's my scheduled run for that show. The director's cut is how I envisioned, how I initially envisioned that show uh, being the most demented child show host. You know? where he would show cartoons and things like that. Um, Awesome. Deviated a little from there. I didn't really want to do that on YouTube because YouTube gets really flaky with what they consider copyright infringement. Yeah. You know, Uh, so I really didn't want to get into it at that point. And at this point, I'm just kind of like, yeah, fuck it. You know, let me get as many up there as I can. And uh, that'll have to be good enough. And I have 
four scheduled out. I have like the next four weeks scheduled, so they're all up on YouTube already. You just can't see them until they actually publish when it hits the schedule time. Uh, and they've already busted two of them. You know? Yeah. And by busted, it's like, it's like, you know, YouTube is just really kind of fucked up when it comes to this, that if anybody makes a claim, then that's copyright infringement. Okay? Which is ridiculous. It's kind of like Plan 9 from Out of Space with Wade Williams. Okay? Yeah. Where he claims that he, he owns the movie because he bought a fucking print. You know? Uh-huh. He doesn't own the movie. The movie is public domain. But if the guy is going to sue you, there's not a lot you can do about that. He feels the same way about uh, Bride of the Monster. Mm-hmm. So, so I have, out of the four, they busted one with this old silent movie, which is really fucked up, called Lot in Sodom. And it's worth the price of admission just to watch that. And a, a 1914 Charlie Chaplin short. Huh. 1914. It's over 100 years old. It is definitely in the public domain. There's no fucking doubt about this. Yeah. You know? But somebody grabs the movie, they throw it on like a like a Mill Creek box set kind of a thing. Yep. And then they claim they own it. And if they put in a complaint, that's, that's just it. You know, crazy. you can file a form to, to dispute it, which I have, <laughs> but you never hear back from that. Yeah. No. You know, they've done that to me with public domain music and all kinds of shit. You know, anything that I got a, a copyright infringement warning on, has not been true because I looked into it. I don't want to be using other people's work, you know. Mm -hmm. I looked into it. It's in the public domain, so I use it, you know. So they busted two of them, but this show is really worth watching. You know, you got you got a section of Bob. You got an interesting cartoon. You get another hit of Bob, and you have a short film of some of some kind of which I'm looking for the most bizarre stuff I could find. One of them is going to have the uh, the 1910 <laughs> Thomas Edison version of Frankenstein. Sweet. Because I find that, I find the monster in that to be really odd looking. Yeah. Really weird. You know? He's almost like the guy from Escape from New York. You know, the hissing guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he kind of looks like that. Just That's good. A weird, a weird look. Um, then you get another hit of Bob, another cartoon, more of Bob, and then out. So they're running anywhere between 20 minutes and a half. Uh, uh, no, 20 minutes and like 40 minutes, depending on the length of the short film. Sweet. That's going to so be that's fun. That's all I got to pump this week. You know, that's going to be coming up tomorrow. So everybody get out there and watch it. Awesome. And be sure and check out the Pope on Film Stitcher page. The Stitcher page. Yes. Which is apparently like a radio station or podcast. So I if you want maybe something to... like that. Like, if you want to listen to a podcast, but you don't want to download it, you just go to Stitcher? I think that's what it is. I may be completely wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm. that's what Stitcher is. So we have a Stitcher page, so you can listen to the Pope on Film without having to download the Pope on Film. So go to Stitcher and check that out. And subscribe to us on all the things. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, watch us on YouTube. You can follow us at, on Twitter at Pope on Film. You can like our Facebook page, or you can email us at Pope at UndeadCal.com. Sweet. Um.
Maxwell, what's wrong? Maxwell, come here. Come here. You want to do a send off? Yeah. Okay. Are you still there? I am still here. Are, are we going to get okay. him to hang up again? Oh, no. Hold on. <laughs> Maxwell, say goodbye. Goodbye. Say goodbye, you godless heathens. You heathens. That was awesome. <laughs> That was pretty awesome, yeah. You didn't say the godless part, though. You need to say goodbye, you godless even. <laughs> he just pretended to fake things. <laughs> no, I see you saying things. It's awesome. I love it when my son faints. It's awesome. Yes. Yes, I'm watching you faint. Yes, you faint good. Okay. The kids are getting restless. I think I need to go. All right. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve. See you next week, godless heathens. Bye. Thanks, Bella. Bye. Cut and print.